everybody, it's Crystal Ann Compton. How are you doing today? I hope you are having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. I'm coming into this video just feeling a lot of love. Just my heart light, ET phone home, turning all red, signaling, connecting with you. I love you. I love my viewers. I love my community. I love this community. In this video, I'm actually going to be responding to one of my subscribers. Her name is Sherry Barnes, and she asks, Hey, Crystal, what age did you start using your gifts? Where did you start? Did you find a teacher? Did you need a teacher? Basically, I'm wanting to know the beginning of your psychic medium path. Thank you for asking, Sherry. I love this question, and I'm going to try and hit all the points because they're all like teachers, whether you need them, when do you start using your gifts? It's all good stuff. Let me start, though, with how my intuitive abilities began to show up for me. These actually manifested, or it wasn't even a manifestation, something that suddenly occurred. They always were. This is, I think, something we need to understand. We came into this incarnation fully equipped with absolutely everything we needed to stay connected intimately, dynamically with the world of spirit. This is why you have children who talk about past lives. This is why you have children who see spirits and energy. And when you watch them interacting with this energy or with these spirits, it seems so natural and effortless. And that's because it is. I can remember as clear as day when my daughter, when she was about three years old, looked up from the dining table into the corner of the room and the ceiling and she said, oh, that's Uncle Dennis. My father's name was Dennis. He had passed before my daughter was born, and I didn't spend a lot of time talking about him. When I heard that name, I asked her to describe who she was seeing, and she described my father at around the time of his death. To the best of her ability, she was three or four years old. And I remembered what I was her age. I was doing the same thing. I was talking to spirits. In fact, my best friends were tree people, no lie. I would sit in this sunbeam in the middle of my room in the afternoon. My mom wanted me to take a nap, but I'd just be sitting there looking out the window because outside of the window was this beautiful banyan tree. I lived in Lahaina, Maui near the beach. And in the banyan tree were these two tree people. They were nature elementals. And I would sit there and talk to them. And when I say talk to them, I would speak to them telepathically, which didn't strike me as strange at all. And I would hear their answers telepathically. And I also felt their nature, their essence. They were fierce. They were strong. But I wasn't scared. Even at that very young age, I had dominion. I knew who it was that I was. And I entered into that interaction fearlessly. In addition to that, I was also able to know things. I was able to perceive energy. One of the things I had for my benefit, that was an advantage, was that my parents were cool about being psychic. They were not cool about a lot of other things. But in that one way, they helped me tremendously. Because as a young child, of course I told my, pe my parents that I was talking to tree people. Of course I shared with them like the things I was seeing. And if something scared me, of course I went to my mama or my father and I asked them about it. And they could have done a lot of things in that moment. They could have said, well, that's just your imagination. Don't even think about it. Nothing to be afraid of. It's not real. They could have gone the other way and said, well, that's demonic or that's the devil. Here's a rosary. Start learning how to pray. They could have done that too. But see, my parents were also very psychic. And so when I went to them, they just explained how it worked and said, oh, well, if you want this result, try this thing. Or if you see this, know that it's just that. And so I was well prepared to continue my exploration in the world of spirit. And I'm so thankful for my folks for that reason. My mom was wildly clairaudient, which means she could actually hear things in the world of spirit. She could hear them externally, meaning sounds in the house, voices in the house. She could also hear that inwardly. She could hear speaking and guidance in her own mind. I remember very often walking by their bedroom and hearing my mom at like six in the morning, seven in the morning as I'm preparing to go to school, actually talking to her team, talking to her 
emissaries and asking them to quiet down. (laughs) She's trying to get 15 more minutes. Can you just quiet down? She was constantly doing that. My dad, on the other hand, he, while a chaotic personality and ultimately an abusive person, he was very clairvoyant. He could see spirits and he took pictures of this. He was very interested in photography and the things that he was catching on his film. He was also claircognizant, which means he just knew things. He didn't know why he knew it. He just knew that he did. And he was usually right. But again, he was very abusive and there was a lot of substance abuse in my, my household as a child. Excuse me. As soon as I start talking about this, I begin to stutter a little bit and that's because the abuse was acute. It was very bad and I've got some cellular memory going on, but I actually think because of that trauma, because of what I witnessed and was put through, I became even more psychic. How many of you out there who have lived in trauma and who have been abused and who have witnessed terrible abuse can validate that your psychic awareness zone actually can expand. I remember for myself, like at around four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, I actually expanded my zone to see where my dad was. Is he coming home drunk tonight? Is there gonna be a problem tonight? Did he leave work? Is he on his way? And I would be able to pick up that information. And many times I was able to know well in advance what my day, what my night, what my weekend was going to look like. So I was real sensitive in that way, trying to protect myself and stay safe. Again, I actually became more psychic because of the abuse. Around the age of 13 or 14, I tripped and fell into Pentecostalism. (laughs) Again, this makes a lot of sense for me because I was an abused kid and I just wanted something safe. I loved The idea that there was a father who loved me and who wanted to protect me and who wanted to take care of me, like that idea was so wonderful to me. And so I just took it all in. I joined a first assembly of God. And to my surprise, this was a very psychic religion. They were prophesying. They were speaking in tongues, light language. They were healing. They were getting slain in the spirit. There was a lot of dynamic energy taking place in this church. Now, not all of my gifts and my abilities fit into the confines of this religion, but enough of them did that I was able to function. Nonetheless, in my 20s, I became disenchanted with religion because it wasn't enough for me. Plus, in organized religion, and I know a lot of you can attest to this, you meet people who use religion as a weapon, don't you? You meet people who use religion as a way to hurt other people, to exclude them, to be within their own bigotry because they feel they can justify this. And um, at some point, as I was continuing to pursue my spiritual connection, this was something I couldn't reconcile. I, I couldn't reconcile like that kind of judgment. It didn't make sense. It was unscriptural to me. And I had an encounter with my then pastor. And in that encounter, like everything became so clear. I was like, whoa, you're just a man. And you have your own faults and, and you're hurting people. And it's like the veils fell away. And I couldn't stay anymore. I couldn't justify it. So I left organized religion. And by then, keep in mind, I had been a missionary. I had been a youth leader, a women's leader. I was a singer in the Jesus band. Talk about totally embedded in religion. I had to uproot myself and leave. And when I tell you that was so very scary for me and traumatizing for me because there's so much fear in Christianity. Well, you're going to go to hell. You're part of the great apostasy. You're backsliding. And all this programming would echo in my mind. I had anxiety about it, but I did it. I left. And so many of us come to that point. We have to. And it is scary to leave what is known. It is scary to leave the structures, even the people, the relationships that used to comfort us in deference to that which is calling us. Can I get an amen? You've got to be brave at this moment in time. 
to strike out on your own. And we are all called to do that, you see. We have to. God said, come, let us reason together. God said, God didn't say, come to this church and pay your tithe and listen to that pastor so you can get some reason, you big knucklehead. Mm -mm. God said, come, let me and you reason together. We can figure this out. Our connection, our relationship, who you really are in relation to me. It's the brave person who opens themselves up to that kind of inquiry. And I did. And over time, I became less afraid. And I started to remember who I was sitting in the middle of a sunbeam talking to tree people. And I started to remember how I used to connect with the essence of rocks and trees and the ocean and turtles and animals. And I started to remember how I used to cast my wide psychic net to protect myself. And I remembered my very divine, magical nature, that nature that was, again, so natural and effortless for me as a child. And I began to align back to that We're talking mid-twenties at this point. I was a little afraid, but I did it anyway. My first order of business was the sleeping prophet himself, the man Edgar Cayce, who was not unlike myself, raised in evangelical Christianity. He was a Bible literalist, memorized the Bible, could quote the Bible. Nonetheless, even amidst the structure of his religion, he became a medium and a channel and a healer. In fact, he's called the father of holistic medicine. I related to Casey, and as I studied Casey, I gave myself more and more permission to explore my own gifts and abilities again. So now we're at about early 30s, mid-30s. I'd connected to all of this magical wonderland that I used to glide around in as a child. And these evidences started popping up in my life again. My intuition was strong. My clairvoyance was strong. My clairaudience, my clairsentience, all of it. I began to channel. Um, I saw dead people. All that happened. And I was caught up in that for a while because it was so wondrous. Doesn't it sound wondrous? But at some point, I began to suspect that it wasn't really the point. Now, of course, early 30s, mid 30s, I began doing intuitive readings for others. I didn't just use my knowing and my abilities for myself and my benefit. I really started to feel the nudge towards service and I wanted to shine that light before men. I wanted to help where I could. And that's just such a natural complement and supplement to spiritual awakening because Spiritual awakening is never selfish. It's not just about you. It's about others. At some point, it becomes about what you're doing with your experience. Like, we got only so many days, so many months, so many years to really do something with this life that we've been given. And so I wanted to do something with it. I had clients. I channeled. um, I wrote. I wrote down my channeling. (laughs) I I rendezvoused with a lot of different beings. I had issues in my own life. God knows I've been married over a million times and I had troubled relationships. But instead of going to a pastor or going to one book and trying to figure it out within the confines of that book, I took that question to spirit, to source energy. Like, what do I do about my marriage? What do I do about my health? What do I do about my eating disorder? I started going within and co-creating my understanding and my experience with the source of all things. Ooh, when we start doing that, now we're cooking with gas. And so I started getting so much information and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon one-on-one readings and counseling and session, it wasn't enough. I wanted more. I started a YouTube channel and started making videos for people. And then I started doing online programs and classes And I'm still doing online programs and classes. And this kind of takes me to your question about teachers. What a great question. As I was honing my intuitive gifts, did I have a teacher? Actually, I did. In Denver, Colorado, I went to a program called the Aspen School for Psychic Development. Now, I'm not sure that's still a thing, but back then it was. And I had fun. 
I was with about a hundred other people studying remote viewing and energy healing and mediumship and it was really cool. But did I need it? Uh uh. <laughs> no. My desire and my intention to connect with spirit had caused all those abilities to come online. I liken it to a dark house. You turn on one light and it illuminates the room. It illuminates maybe part of the floor. But as more lights start coming on in the house, soon the whole house is ablaze and illumined and lit up. And our abilities are kind of like that. They're lights that we start to turn on when we get into alignment with who it is that we truly are. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. In the beginning of my teaching, I focused a lot on psychic abilities and intuitive gifts, and I still love to talk about that. Hello, it's great. But nowadays, I'm way more interested in the first part of that scripture. Seek first your connection to the kingdom of heaven. Just another way to say God, creator, source, the I am. Seek first that. Come, let us reason together. And all these other things, clairvoyance and clairaudience and mediumship or whatever it is that can happen in terms of spiritual gifts, all those things just happen naturally when we seek that connection. I like to talk about that. I also like to remind people, I'm no different than you. You were the same kind of baby as I was. You came into your incarnation fully equipped and fully connected to the world of spirit, and you still are. Is it dormant? Maybe. Can it awaken? Absolutely, and it's just waiting to. Do you need a teacher to coax it out of you? 100% no. You don't need me to do that. You watch me because maybe it's interesting. I don't know why you watch me, but maybe, I don't know why you watch me, but you don't need me. You are your own teacher. You are your own guru and the call back to that intimate and dynamic connection with source exists inside of you. The kingdom of heaven is within you, not me, although we're the same. That's another video, but exists within you. That's how it all began. I had it easy because parents didn't disabuse me. I had it hard because parents were crazy. I had it easy because I landed in a religion that allowed me to be a little psychic. And I had it hard because religion is hard and it can be really shallow. Life isn't supposed to be easy and this isn't supposed to be something that we just happily and joyfully discover about ourselves. Sometimes it takes trials and tribulations and I've had a lot of those. But boy, am I grateful. And let me end with that. I am so grateful for everything that I've been given and for all of my experiences, especially the painful ones and all of my great teachers, those that I sought out through schooling and education and those who just happened to come into my life and give me something I truly needed. I hope I gave them something as well. And I hope I've answered your questions, Sherry, and I hope I've given you all something as well. Drop down into the comments. Let me know when you connected with your intuitive gifts and whether you use them today. And don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. If you're so inclined, whatever. We'll do what we gotta do. All right, until the next video, until our next rendezvous, never forget that I have nothing but love for you. Have a beautiful day, guys.